joined once again by Jason Sago, who is a uh, UFC lightweight fighter who we haven't seen in a while. Uh, Jason, how are you today? Great, James. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. You know, I was looking down the UFC roster and I saw your name come up and I kind of was thinking, you know, it's been a while since we've seen you in the cage. Of course, you haven't fought since September at UFC 215. So I think the million dollar question, uh, what's the latest with you? What's going on these days? Well, it's going to be a while before you see me in the cage because I started up my own academy here actually in Prince Edward Island in uh, the city of Summerside. So I kind of took away, um, be stepping away from competition for at least uh, one year, at least for all of 2018, just focusing on uh, building the school, developing my, my student base over there on uh, Summerside, Prince Edward Island. Excellent. When did you sort of make this decision? Was it after the fight or did you know this even before the Gilbert Burns fight? Um, it was something I was considering before the fight uh, with Gilbert Burns and it just – you know, it was it was just good timing. You know, I was going into the new year and stuff, and uh, January is like a busy time for for gyms, martial arts academies, and stuff like that. And uh, as you know, you've talked to enough fighters to know that you know fighting isn't the most uh, financially stable way of receiving an income. So I figured it'd be good to develop a, a business on the side. You know, build up a student base and kind of have another uh, stream of income coming in besides fighting because with fighting, you know, it's sometimes you get injured, sometimes your opponent gets injured. Um, you know, it's tough to, uh, have fighting as the only source of income. You know, it's not, it's not so reliable, not unless you're like top 10 in the UFC, you're going to be probably struggling a little bit if fighting's the only source of income. Right. And so you're sort of looking long-term with this gym and everything and kind of looking into the next phase of your career after fighting, which we, as we, you know, we've said here is not now, but it's something you're definitely looking at down the line. For sure, yeah. I think I said I'd take uh, one year off competition, and that way I can really, you know, develop the student base. You know, we have a kids program going, a women's only. I'm teaching Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes, Muay Thai classes. So it's just very time intensive, and you know, you can't be you know, training for a fight full time and also running an academy full time. So I figured I just wanted to put all of my, my time and energy and resources into building up the academy, developing a strong student base and then have a solid, you know, monthly income coming in. And then after that happens, then I can decide whether I want to go back to competing again and see where, where my, my desire is. You know, I'm still training at least once a day, you know, making sure I'm, I'm improving, just getting that 1% better each day. But really it came down to, uh, financial means you know and uh i just wanted to get something in my life more reliable than fighting you know spending like a decade fighting whether it's you know muay thai or mma it's just it always seems to be like you know hit or miss either you know you get injured your opponent gets injured or you know it just it's never you know a steady source of income so i wanted to have that in my life for more stability okay that makes sense um did you talk to the ufc about this after your last fight like when did you contact them to kind of let them know hey listen I'm good for, for fights for the next little bit. Uh, you know, just so you know, I'm doing this academy. Actually, I was pretty surprised. The UFC actually released me after the last fight. Oh, no way. Okay. Gotcha. So, so two yeah, in a row and that was it. Know. They, they let, they let you go. Yeah. Yeah. It was two in a row. I was a little bit surprised. I thought, uh, I would have gotten one more fight, you know, cause I was basically three and two, three wins and two losses going into the fight with Burns and then after that fight it was three and three and I know there's lots of other fighters on the roster that are you know three and three so I thought maybe you know would have been given uh, another chance but uh, I guess it just didn't work out that way so it was even more reason for me to start an academy that's crazy you know some fighters lose like four in a row and they're still on the roster and they, they let you go um you know that's it's kind of interesting Jason just because uh, you're a guy that you know is very entertaining we've seen some really good fights out of you um mm -hmm. I, I'm a little surprised to hear that Thanks. I gotta be honest yeah, yeah, and I don't know exactly how uh, official it is. Like, I know I'm still on the, the UFC.com website and stuff, so maybe, uh, you know, it's not something that was you know, going to be announced or not, Or, but um, I, I did get uh, something from uh, Shelby saying that it was released from the promotion, so... You know, that's yeah. I was I was pretty surprised as well, but uh, and unfortunately, that's the way things went. So, how did you find out? Was it an email, a text? How did, or did they call you? Uh, how, how did you find out the news? It was um, it was a text from Sean, as well as uh, my manager. Kind of, um, I think it was a few weeks um, after the fight. Oh wow! Okay. And um, you know, just to just to text saying sorry. You know, they 
adding, you know, new guys to the roster and stuff like that. You know, they're always looking for their next Conor McGregor or the next big draw, right? That's, you know, they're a business. They're trying to make the most money for themselves. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, they just said they had to let me go. So it was it was tough to hear the news at first. But, you know, one door closes, another door opens. So I was able to then kind of say, okay, now I'm going to put 100% of my focus in building the academy and then, if I decide to after a year, then I'll go back to competing again. Okay, so this makes a little bit more sense now because I could see if you were still on the roster and, you know, you were trying to do this and maybe you just, you know, kind of figure out timing. But obviously uh, there's a big drop off financially when you're fighting on the regional scene as opposed to fighting in the UFC, especially in Canada. It's the options are so limited right now. Uh, you know, there, there's a you know a couple of promotions in Western Canada. There's TKO in Montreal. But even then, uh, financially, it's just not as lucrative as it is in the UFC. Yeah, like anything on a local level, you know, you only get paid uh, a few grand. You make up a few grand in sponsors and stuff like that. But, I mean, with the UFC, at least, you know, you're, you're going to get a minimum of, you know, 10 grand, win or lose, and then you're potentially you know, doubling that and even more. So it's definitely more lucrative being in the UFC. But there's always, you know, cut to your manager, cut to the gym. Um, if you fight in the States, they automatically take 30%. So if you got 30% um, automatically taken off your paycheck when you fight in the States and you got 10% going to your manager, another 10% uh, going to your gym, so you go, there goes 50% of your paycheck right there. And maybe you fight once every four months, you know, so it's it's hard. The numbers, the numbers don't really make sense, right? So for me, it's like whether I was going to continue fighting or not, I needed to have another source of income. As, as you know, you've talked to enough fighters to know the struggle on that side. Like how do you get through a training camp? Well, trying to work a job, you know, and feed your family, you know, so it's, it, it's tough. It's tough. This, the lifestyle of a fighter, it's, it's no, it's not easy. You know what I mean? It's not easy to go in there and, you know, dealing with the, the fear of going into combat and fighting and, you know, the stress of training and all of that. And plus the financial side, of it you know it's it's not a, not the easiest lifestyle but you know people love it you know that's why you do it like for me i've always loved martial arts i've always loved the training side that's why no matter what whether i'm competing or not i'm still going to continue to train i'm still going to get be getting better every day it's been a, a big part of just just improving every day whether it's jujitsu muay thai you know striking arts or grappling arts i'm still wanting to get better every day absolutely did you at least text uh, sean back to ask if you get like a discount to the performance institute if you want to go back there anything like that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think they, I think they have something for like UFC vets or something where you okay. you can you can train there. But uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't push my luck too much. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's talk about the academy. Uh, I mean, this is a great endeavor for you, and and you know, obviously, uh, it's an area that needs to be filled as well. You know, being where you're from, I'm sure you know there's lots of people who want to learn, uh, you know, about martial arts. And coming from a UFC uh, veteran like yourself, it, it seems like a great idea. Was there anyone you spoke with ahead of time to kind of figure out how to go about this? Because because, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into starting your own gym and academy. Oh, definitely. Like, luckily, uh, my head coach, Paul Abel, you know, he's always had my back since day one. And he has a successful gym running out of uh, Charlottetown, uh, Prince Edward Island. It's where I train Wolfron Mixed Martial Arts. And there's, you know, there's 40 people on the mats every night there training. So um, he has a successful gym. So he gave me a few pointers starting out um, another uh, one of my friends, Jason Ficliano, he runs a gym in Ontario and he's kind of been doing like weekly coaching calls for me and he has about 250 students um, in Ontario. So I got good people on my side to help kind of guiding me through it. And, you know, it's better to kind of learn from somebody else's mistakes than making them on your own. So they've been kind of coaching me and helping me along and just, you know, it's a different role when you're competing, you know, for yourself and training every day for yourself to going to more of a coaching um, role and also like managing a gym where you're the one now taking on that, you know, the leadership role and making sure that every practice, everyone's learning something and giving them your time and attention. It's, it's kind of a different, different aspect that I'm, I'm a adjusting to so where are we at right now with the academy is I, i'm guessing it's open and people are using it like what what at what stage are we at right now yeah it just opened january 2nd uh was our first day of classes and it's been just slowly and steadily increasing we're about at 35 full-time members right now um it's been great you know there's been consistently you know 15 20 people on the mats and i've been surprised it actually uh the, the turnout and how many people are, are just there and very supportive and want to learn martial arts, you know, and for one thing I didn't realize for myself was uh, I've never taught kids before. 
So I didn't know what that was going to be like kind of like going into it. So starting to teach kids has been really kind of refreshing instead of, you know, um, hanging out with the, uh, you know, fighters who have a, kind of a different kind of demeanor. When you go to hang out with, with kids, they're just, they're a joy to teach, you know, so it's really a kind of a added a different, you know, lighter kind of aspect to the training and stuff like that. So I've been, I'm enjoying teaching the kids classes and, now that I'm not competing as much, I've also had more time to volunteer. Like just uh, on Thursday last week, I went to the Boys and Girls Club of Summerside. So I was able to introduce martial arts to a younger uh, group of kids and they really appreciated that. And I, I enjoyed that experience. So I'm glad I'm able to kind of go go about and just, you know, volunteer my time a little bit more and introduce uh, martial arts to the community. Very cool. I, I think that's excellent. And again, uh, you know, like you said, you're able to give back. So there's a, you know, obviously very rewarding uh, being able to do that. Um, now, as far as some of the challenges that you faced uh, with this, uh, what would have been some of the things that have kind of uh, maybe you didn't expect or things that you've sort of encountered along the way? Um, or, has it, or has it been smooth sailing? <laughs> Uh, it's been fairly smooth. Well, setting up a business, you know, like uh, a small business, like um, learning a lot more about the taxes and how it's it's uh, everything's he more heavily taxed. Like, you know, even even small things, small little expenses for those people that don't own a gym or run anything like, you know, corporate. It's like everything's more expensive. You want you want Internet. So it's not residential. It's it, it's commercial. Now you're paying more, even though it's the same service. You just have to pay more because it's a commercial enterprise. So there's been just some surprises and kind of like learning curves uh, along the way. But um, so far, I've been very happy with the, the turnout and the student base. And uh, I've had a lot of fun teaching. And it's something that I want to do, um, whether I'm competing or not. I still want to continue uh, continue teaching because I, I do get a lot out of that. Right. And you mentioned, uh, you know, the financial aspect of being a fighter. Um, how how are you sort of able to, you know, fund this? Because uh, I know it's not cheap to set up your own business and everything like that. Have you been working another job or how, how did you sort of come about? Uh, or, or are you just good at saving money? Well, I did, I, I did use some of the money from uh, the fight purse, obviously, to, you know, spend money and invest into the business. You know, if you're starting a, a gym, you know, you spend $7,000 on mats. So, you know, that we had to import the, these mats from Belgium and it's got good quality mats. So some of the money um, I used to invest in the gym, the startup of my gym, and then some of it also came out from a, a loan from the bank. So, you know, a combination uh, of both and I was able to get it going. Luckily, it's not um, a very, you know, a cap, a capital, highly high capital business where you have to invest like a ton of money. Most important thing about a gym is just having, you know, good quality mats, you know, it doesn't have to be like super luxurious on the inside. As long as you got mats to train on and, you know, for four walls, you're, you you should be able to run a gym. Most people, most students are going to go to the gym for the instructor, not so much the facility itself. Okay. Uh, so if you if you did come back and, and return to mixed martial arts, uh, when would that be? Because you said a year. What are we counting from the last fight or, or like this year? I would say like so this year, all of 2018, I'm just focused on building the business, expanding it, you know, just uh, making sure that the financial side of my life is just taken care of. So that way. It doesn't matter whether I fight or not. You know, I don't need that fight fight income. And, you know, that just puts more more stress. You know, when you're going into a fight and you're like, oh, shit, like I need this fight income. I need to get that win bonus. It adds kind of that unnecessary stress. So I think in competing um, potentially, you know, January 2019, February 2019, I think that would be a good time for me to start looking back into competing. And I feel like I still want to compete. I still have that desire. And also I still I'm still young enough. You know, I'm only 31 years old, so I still got a few solid years left in me yeah i agree with that um as far as um you know uh what weight class you'd come back and would it still be at lightweight are you happy there yeah i'm i'm not uh, you know some of these guys at lightweight they're walking around at like 185 stuff like that I, I never walk around that heavy i'm like 170 175 so it's not really a big issue for me to make that 155 uh mark limit you know and uh uh, you would probably know more about like the you, the the weight classes being introduced. I've heard you know different things about potentially new weight classes, but for me, I think the 155 weight class has always been you know a solid weight class for me. My last question before I let you go here, and again, I really appreciate the time. Uh, the loss to, to Burns is your first knockout loss, so you know I got to know how much time did you take off from that? Because I know well, there's so much information now out there about concussions and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you had to really sort of you know look because this is new for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, luckily, I was able to talk to uh, Faraz Sahabi after the fight and stuff. So um, he's always been very you know, helpful and he has a wealth of knowledge. So he gave me some interesting information about how to recover from a concussion. You know, I've never had a concussion my whole life and that was my first one. So um, luckily, I didn't really have any uh, severe symptoms. I was I was pretty... I was okay, you know, I didn't have any injury, but I still took the time off, though, no matter what. I just wanted to make sure that I want to be healthy after my career is over. So I did take um, a serious time off of uh, training. Like, I took at least two months off of, like, non-contact. Like, nothing no, nothing to my head. I didn't do any contact for at least two months. And uh, right now, I feel like 100%. Like, I feel like I could go and compete again. And my body feels good. I'm, I'm strong. I'm still sh- sharp because I am training, like I said, like, pretty much every day. I, I'm getting a session in for myself. So, um, luckily, I don't have any, like, lingering symptoms from the concussion. Not to say that, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything, you know, to avoid. It's probably one of the worst things that can happen to a fighter is, you know, receiving like a, a KO, right? I mean, uh, I didn't know what it was going to be like. I've always heard of other fighters and I ha- I've had some friends had their careers ended by getting knocked out. You know, uh, one of my friends can't even, you know, for I think it was about four months, he couldn't even walk up the stairs without getting dizzy. So, you know, comparing it to that, I came out, you know, I came out pretty good. Well, uh, Jason, I'm really happy to hear you have this new endeavor. I wish you the best of luck with it. Uh, Just remind people where they can find you on social media and any information about your gym, the name of it, all that stuff. Uh, By all means, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Sure. Just check out uh, website jasonsago.com. And also, if you're ever in Prince Edward Island, it's a great vacation spot, nice beaches here during the summer. You can come check out my academy in uh, Summerside. It's summersidemartialarts.com. What's up, Fight Fans? If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to see even more interviews with your favorite UFC and Bellator fighters. We've also got coverage at events, including post-fight press conferences and media scrums. And if you like this video, check out the video to my right. It's worth your time.